an elderly woman with dementia, holding her grandson, watching birds on the balcony. Suddenly, she felt ill, and left the child on a low stool. She ran back home by herself. The child wanted to reach out for the birds in mid-air. It was just one step away from falling off the balcony. Fortunately, the parents noticed in time, and they found out that she had been to the rooftop. Due to this accident, Leo wanted to send his mother to a nursing home. This idea almost cost him his life. Leo is just a taxi driver. He can't afford the cost of a nursing home. Fortunately, he often drives, the daughter of the nursing home director for shopping. Maybe he can get some discounts. The next day, Leo went to the nursing home to inquire. He met a technician and started a conversation. The technician also couldn't afford to bring his mother there, but the nursing home exempted all the fees. The technician found it suspicious, so he wanted to bring his mother back home. He also advised Leo not to bring his family members there, but Leo had already made up his mind. Leo's mother didn't understand her son's intentions. She thought he had found her a job. When Leo's mother heard the truth, she knelt down in front of her son and begged. She didn't want to leave her family, but Leo still left, ignoring his weeping mother behind him. In the evening, Leo finished his work. He decided to visit his mother at the nursing home. The massive house was empty with no one inside. From the dim space, his mother's voice could be heard. Leo went over to investigate. He saw a butcher chopping off his mother's arm. The next second, he woke up from the dream. Leo immediately got up and rushed to the nursing home. To his surprise, everything was exactly like in his dream. The empty lobby had no one. He approached the room where his mother was trapped in his dream. Fortunately, there was no scene from his dream inside. Leo walked to the end of the restaurant. He noticed many young people drinking and chatting. Nurse Amy approached to inquire about the situation. Leo said he wanted to take his mother home. The nurse explained, your situation is very common. Children feel guilty and uneasy on the first day. They send their parents to a nursing home. They may even have nightmares throughout the night. The nurse reassured Leo. Leo's mother will receive the best care. Leo asked about the people in the kitchen. The nurse explained. These are the children of the nursing home residents. When they come to visit their parents, they regularly organize gatherings. Leo also wanted to visit his mother. But the nurse claimed that the elderly were already asleep. You can come next week. When your mother has adjusted to the environment, Leo had no choice but to leave. But he still felt uneasy, so he decided to quietly return. He hid inside the nursing home to observe the situation. A young couple was chatting in the hallway. They mentioned something about a ceremony. Leo hid in a room, and eavesdropped carefully. The man in a suit opened the door. Leo quickly hid inside the wardrobe. His phone suddenly vibrated. The man in a suit was about to come closer. Suddenly, a bell rang from the nursing home. Upon hearing that, the man in a suit took off his clothes. He put on a black robe and walked over. He opened the wardrobe door. Leo hid on one side, afraid to move. The man in a suit entered a hidden door behind the wardrobe. He forgot to lock it again. Leo also followed inside. He was in a certain room. He discovered the person from earlier, the one called John, who wanted to take his mother home. John was tied to an iron bed. Then, footsteps could be heard in the corridor. Leo immediately hid under the bed. He held onto the iron bed, suspending his body, so as not to be discovered by the person in the black robe. This group of people pushed John to the ritual site and placed him in front of his mother. Then, two demons emerged from the wall. They grabbed the heads of the mother and son, absorbing their energy. The monsters with baby faces emitted satisfied purring sounds. John was still struggling, but the leader of the group sent a negotiator to convince John to comply with the arrangements for the sake of his mother. As John gradually gave up resistance, he rapidly aged and died, while his mother regained her youth. Leo took the opportunity to slip away. Unexpectedly, he left his phone behind, and it started ringing. John's mother picked up the phone to check. The light hurt the demons on the wall. The man in the black robe immediately commanded everyone to find the intruder. At that moment, Leo retraced his steps, but found the door locked. Fortunately, he encountered the daughter of the director, who had previously advised Leo not to send his mother to the nursing home. She didn't reveal the truth at that time, 
now she decided to be completely honest with Leo. The first generation elderly who live here are either wealthy or privileged. Because they were abandoned by their children, they raise monsters from the underground. These monsters can drain the life force of young people and make the elderly regain their youth. However, the exchange can only happen between parent and child, and both parties must willingly accept the exchange. These monsters are extremely dangerous and can emit flammable gas. Leo couldn't understand why he and John's mother, who were both poor, were chosen by the nursing home. The daughter of the director explained that wealthy people who undergo rejuvenation need slaves, and she herself is controlled by them. After the daughter of the director finished speaking, she gave Leo a key and took off her robe, telling him to find a way to escape on his own. On the other side, John's mother commanded a creature called the Exile to track down the owner of the phone by its smell. Leo, wearing a black robe, searched everywhere for his mother and finally found her in a dark room. He found the key and unlocked the shackles on his mother's hands, while the daughter of the director, without the protection of a black robe, was brutally killed by two exiles. At that moment, Leo carried his mother and fled to the corridor, but was intercepted by the people in black robes. Before he could get far, the two of them were brought before the wall monster, but Leo refused to cooperate. The people in black robes sent another negotiator, and Leo was about to be drained of his energy. Yet, Leo's mother refused the temptation of rejuvenation, urging her son to leave quickly. Leo remembered the words of the director's daughter, and took out a lighter to ignite the gas emitted by the monster. He made every effort to escape the inferno, and the nursing home turned into ruins. The first story ends here. Jakarta in 2024. A rumor is circulating in the town, that if you adopt an orphan called the Demon Child, you will become rich overnight, and have continuous good luck. However, the adopters will mysteriously die after seven days. Upon hearing this rumor, Ios was somewhat tempted. He wanted to persuade his wife, Ipa, to adopt the demon child and kill him on the sixth day, as he believed that since the child was a demon, eliminating him for the people did not require guilt. Ipa was unwilling. They owed three months' rent, and if they couldn't earn money, they would have to sleep on the road. Moreover, the landlord was a crazy person who threatened them by pouring gasoline at their doorstep. Ipa had no choice but to agree to Ios's request. The next day, they went to the orphanage to complete the paperwork and met the demon child Siaphon. He had a cute appearance and a physical disability, appearing thin and harmless. The staff kindly reminded them. Kalian berdua menginginkan sesuatu dari dia. Tapi untuk dapatkan itu kalian juga harus kasih dia sesuatu. That the child was not terrifying and that all the child needed was genuine love from the adoptive parents. The couple brought him home. Siaphon didn't mind the humble room and food. Ios and Ipa couldn't help, but imagine that once they had money, they would buy a large villa and keep the air conditioning as cold as winter. It would be better if they could have a soft, big bed. Just as the words fell, Ios found cash under the pillow. It seems that the folk legend was not a lie. The next day, Siaphon found a photograph A. Andy asked Ipa who the child in it was. It turned out that the couple had a son, who passed away a long time ago. Just then, Ios came home with a newly bought toy car. Both he and his wife had to go out to work and earn money, so he asked the boy who he wanted to accompany today. Siaphon chose to accompany Ipa to collect garbage. Ipa instructed the boy to wait in the shade, while she carried a basket and collected plastic. Suddenly, she heard the voice of her own son, and a truck came rushing by. Ipa forced herself to stay calm, reminding herself that her son, Lin, had long been dead and that it was all just an illusion. In the next moment, the garbage truck headed towards Siaphon. Ipa dropped the basket and shouted, but the driver couldn't hear anything. She rushed over and pushed Siaphon away. Ipa felt guilty because of what happened earlier. She led Siaphon back home, while the creditor stood nearby, watching them. In the evening, Ipa cooked a big meal with the money from yesterday. Siaphon mentioned that he was allergic to peanuts, and eating even a little could be life-threatening. The family of three enjoyed their meal happily, but Ios was somewhat dissatisfied, and he privately warned his wife. How is it that within just one day, that child is already calling you mother? Don't forget, we adopted him only for money. Don't develop any emotions. Ipa didn't explain. Maybe my acting was too good, and that child felt love. So he called me mother. At that moment, there was a loud noise from the roof. The two of them lifted the wooden boards and surprisingly found a pair of golden bracelets. The next day, 
Ios sold the bracelets for money and went to find the creditor to repay the debt. Tambahnya buat abang beli rokok, bang. The golden bracelets were just the beginning of their good luck. Their money kept increasing, and they started taking siphon to expensive restaurants. The waiter, seeing their shabby clothes, couldn't help but mock them. Io silenced him by throwing cash at him. But right after siphon took the first bite of food, he suddenly had difficulty breathing and collapsed. They took him to the hospital and discovered that he had a peanut allergy. Io blamed his wife for not being careful enough, almost causing the child's death. But Ipa knew that her husband didn't care about Siafin's well-being at all. He was only afraid that if something happened to the boy, they wouldn't be able to get rich. Ios felt that he hadn't done anything wrong. He had long suspected that Ipa was lying that night. His wife had developed emotions for the child. Since Siafin received timely medical treatment, his health wasn't seriously affected. Ios paid the medical expenses and took them back home. Yet, he sat there all night, but didn't receive any unexpected wealth. The next day, it started pouring rain, and the water leaked into their dilapidated house. Ios believed that it was, because he hadn't taken care of Siafin properly yesterday, that they didn't have any money today. He wanted to take Siafin out to play with the remaining money, but Ipa had already changed her mind. She was willing to give up the dream of getting rich quickly, and raise Siafin. She didn't want to harm the child. But Ios had already lost his sanity. After tasting the sweetness of getting something for nothing, he couldn't stop his greedy desires. Ipa drove away Ios, who had touched the child. In the evening, the mother and son lay in bed sleeping. Ios returned home and searched around, hoping to find some money appearing today. He turned around and saw Siafin sitting on the bed, staring at him. Ios picked up a knife for self-defense. Fortunately, nothing happened that night. On the sixth day of adopting Siafin, Ipa woke up from a dream. She realized Siafin wasn't on the bed, so she opened the back door to check. She saw the collapse of the garbage mountain behind, which hit Siafin playing below. Ipa rushed over and frantically dug through the garbage mountain with her husband to rescue Siafin. But the next moment, the garbage mountain collapsed again. Before long, Ios woke up from unconsciousness and found himself in a luxurious dream house. Moreover, the property certificate had his and his wife's names on it, while Siafin remained in a coma, and it was already the seventh day. Ipa looked at the frail boy and refused to let her husband harm anyone. Ios ran downstairs and packaged all the kitchen utensils, knives, and forks in the villa and sold them out. In the evening, he came back with a newly purchased toy, intending to apologize to Siafin for what happened before. This gesture was indeed rewarded. When a large bag of cash fell from the sky, Ios looked upstairs thoughtfully. Late at night, Ipa was awakened by thunder. She realized Siafin wasn't beside her, and the bedroom door was locked. It turned out that Ios hadn't given up on the idea of killing Siafin. He had already obtained the house and a large sum of money, but didn't want to keep the child. Ipa saw her husband digging a hole in the yard. She climbed over the second floor railing to reach the first floor. Ipa untied the rope from Siafin's body and escaped the villa with the boy. Ios chased after them with a shovel. He pursued them all the way to their old house, intending to take Siafin away. Unexpectedly, Ipa stabbed her husband several times from behind. She did this not to kill her husband but to stop him, so she planned to find a doctor for emergency treatment. However, Ios held on to his wife. It was too late for him to turn back, as he wanted to go to heaven to be with his biological son. Ios stopped breathing after saying that. Ipa also wanted to die with her husband. Siafin hurriedly approached and covered his mother's wound, emitting a dazzling light from his palm. This story concludes with an open-ended ending. Poems and Pains Rania is a writer specializing in writing light-hearted literature. The representative work Poems and Pains gained some popularity. She grew tired of mechanical writing, wrote a new literary book called Period. Unfortunately, readers didn't like it. The sales and reviews of the new book were not optimistic. She had to pay high monthly mortgage and car loans, so the editor suggested her to write a sequel to Poems and Pains, which Rania refused, because that book had a magical power, where the contents became reality. March 30, 2019, Rania was working on Poems and Pains, with the protagonist named Laris. Two months after marriage, she discovered 
that her husband had abusive and controlling tendencies and locked Laris in the basement, subjecting her to abuse. One day, Rania fell asleep while writing, but upon waking up, she found 10 additional pages in the document, including scenes of Laris being abused by her husband. Most importantly, Rania felt sore all over her body, as if she had been beaten. At first, she didn't pay much attention to it, but in the following days, she would inexplicably fall asleep, and in her dreams, she continued to write. The scenes of Laris being abused by her husband, and the pain would transfer to Rania's body. Could it be a psychological effect? Rania comforted herself. It must be because she was too invested, that she empathized with the characters in the book. She completed the writing with her exhausted body. Fortunately, Poems and Pains. The novel made it to the bestseller list for seven months, and allowed Rania to move into a big house. That period of memories was both painful and happy. Rania turned off the video. She looked at the mortgage information, feeling conflicted. She decided to write a sequel to Poems and Pains. After all, she still needed to earn money. But things didn't go smoothly. She could only write two lines a day. Rania gradually started feeling drowsy. The next day, she woke up from her desk. She wanted to take a hot bath to relax. But suddenly, her back experienced intense pain. She looked at herself in the mirror, only to discover large bruises on her body. Rania immediately went downstairs to check her computer. And indeed, there were many additional drafts. And in the text, Laris's back was bruised as well. Even if Rania was slow to catch on, she realized that something was wrong. She approached her editor to cancel the sequel. But to her surprise, the people at the publishing house had already read the 30-page initial draft last night, and they loved it, believing it would be a big hit. Helpless, Rania simply bought a surveillance system and had the editor monitor her entire writing process. If anything suspicious was noticed, they would quickly call and wake her up. As the story progressed, and Laris was being abused, Rania started experiencing corresponding injuries on her body. Even when the editor called, it didn't wake her up. Rania seemed to have entered Laris's perspective. Not long after, the editor rushed over to wake her up, saying that Rania had been staring at the ceiling for half an hour, and several dozen pages of content had appeared on the computer. They realized Rania hadn't written those words. The editor wanted to persuade her to stop writing, but it was the first time for Rania to personally experience what Laris had gone through. Previously, she had only woken up feeling sore all over. For some reason, Rania had a feeling that Laris truly existed, and in some corner of this world, she was being abused, so she wanted to uncover the truth. The editor advised Rania not to act impulsively. This time, she had only been physically abused, but what if in the next chapter, Laris's limbs were to be severed? Do you really want to risk your life? To verify this absurd speculation? Rania was stubborn. Once she decided on something, she would do it. That same evening, she opened the document again. Rania successfully entered Laris's perspective. According to the setting in the book, she was locked in the basement by her husband. It seemed that she also had a beautiful daughter. She picked up her daughter's notebook. It said, Mom loves Asti. The little girl had been kept in the basement and had never seen the outside world. She had no idea what the outside world looked like. She had heard her mom talk about it. The story of how her father proposed in a restaurant. The girl couldn't understand why her father had become the way he was now. Laris explained, it was because daddy loved us too much. He was too afraid of losing us. Just then, Laris noticed her wedding ring was missing. Fear immediately filled every pore of Laris's being. If her husband found out, she would surely be beaten to death. The mother and daughter hurriedly searched everywhere for the ring, but her husband had already come home from work. The man grabbed Laris's hand and noticed the ring was missing. He started violently beating the woman. Intense pain transmitted to Rania's body. She wouldn't endure silently like the protagonist. Rania focused her attention, urging Laris to grab the pencil on the table and fight back. She directly pierced her husband's palm. The man encountered resistance for the first time. He went completely mad. He nearly beat Laris to half death. Rania woke up with injuries all over her body. She went to the hospital for an examination. Fortunately, no internal organs were harmed. Rania wanted to save the woman. In the evening, Rania called the editor to her home. If her injuries became too severe, the editor could wake Rania up in time. Once everything was prepared, 
she would enter Laris's body again. Rania wanted to find a mirror, to see what Laris looked like. She observed through standing water. She saw her own face. The next moment, Rania regained consciousness. What on earth was happening? Could it be that she had a twin sister? Rania asked the editor to accompany her back to her hometown. She hadn't returned home in 12 years, because when Rania was young, she had a car accident while playing with her younger brother, causing the death of her talented younger brother. Rania never received forgiveness from her parents, resulting in a strained relationship. The two soon arrived at Rania's hometown and learned from their parents. She indeed had a twin sister, but due to poor conditions in earlier years, her parents had given her younger sister up for adoption. When they regretted wanting their child back, they had already lost contact with each other. It seems that only by entering the world of the book, can they find more clues? Rania, accompanied by the editor, fell asleep again. This time, Asti caught a cold. Laris wanted to take her daughter out of the basement to see a doctor outside. But the man insisted on giving Asti some fever-reducing medicine. Laris argued with him for their daughter, and the man used physical violence again. At this moment, Rania made her appearance. She took control of her sister's body to resist the violence. The abusive man suddenly felt a supernatural force. The flashback scene was from the nursing home in the old house. It seems that there is a connection between the different stories. When the man regained consciousness, he started suspecting Rania's identity. This woman was definitely not Laris. The man panicked and fled the basement, and Rania picked up his badge, which had the name of the company where the man works. Rania grabbed this clue and started investigating his identity, and eventually confirmed that this person's name was Adrian. He was married to another woman, and they raised two children together. Laris had been kept in the dark. The editor drove to Adrian's house, while Rania was afraid of her sister and the children getting hurt, so she had to return to the world inside the book again. Unexpectedly, Adrian appeared with a hammer. He wanted to kill Laris, and the person hidden inside Laris. At this moment, the editor woke up Rania. They had arrived at Adrian's location, because the front door was unlocked. Rania went straight to ring the doorbell, and lied to Adrian's wife. I'm from the corporate department. I need to find Adrian for something important. Adrian's wife responded. Every time my husband goes to the study, he locks the door and turns off his phone. Rania entered the house directly, and Adrian happened to come out of the study. The editor immediately drew a gun and aimed at him. While instructing Rania to search the study, she lifted the carpet and entered the basement and successfully found Laris. <laughs> The woman said her piece, and then stopped breathing. Rania first took Asti to see a doctor, and then called the police to arrest Adrian. When the police arrived at the scene, they found the place empty, with no one around. Even the surveillance cameras revealed nothing. <laughs> then the fourth story, The Encounter, unfolded. In the late night of 1985 in North Jakarta, a shell digger named Wahyu had just finished his shift. He opened a hidden compartment beneath the floor and put the money he earned into a plastic bag. It contained all of Wahyu's savings. Once he saved enough money, he could go to Saudi Arabia to search for his mother. The wife never understood her husband's obsession. The woman left home when Wahyu was seven years old and ran away from home. It was Wahyu's birthday that night. His wife's factory had a lottery event for anniversary. She won an instant camera and gave it to her husband as a birthday present. The next day, the village had a free movie screening, and everyone went to the small square to enjoy the show. Except for Wahyu, who went to the beach to collect seashells. Suddenly, there was a thunderstorm, and Wahyu actually saw an angel. He quickly took out the instant camera to capture the moment, and he ran back home, trembling all over. His wife thought he was possessed. However, Wahyu took out the photo, and the image on it was indeed not human. When the villagers heard the news, they crowded around Wahyu's house to see. Although they weren't sure what it was, the village chief said, Angels often appear to deliver messages from God, and they only appear to chosen individuals. Wahyu might become a prophet and save our village. It turned out that this small fishing village was facing the threat of demolition and redevelopment. A big corporation wanted to drive them away and build apartment buildings here. Initially, the corporation targeted the neighboring village, but there were ancestral graves on their land, should be protected by the law. The villagers intended to use Wahyu's sighting of the angel as leverage 
and claim that the village was blessed by God, and should not be demolished. Unexpectedly, they were actually driven away. The representatives sent by the company. In the evening, several women gathered to talk. They all claimed that Wahyu was the savior, because only someone as calm as him, would listen attentively to the voice of God. This statement spread among the villagers, and transformed into the belief, that Wahyu had mind-reading abilities. His wife, Daija, felt extremely guilty, fearing that Wahyu would discover her affair with Little Beard. That night, Daija returned home and discovered, that her husband was moving their hidden money, which increased her suspicion, that their secret would be exposed. The next morning, when Wahyu woke up, he realized his wife was missing, and the clothes in the wardrobe, along with the six million rupees he had saved, had disappeared, leaving behind only a photo of Wahyu with his mother. Upon hearing the news, Alu and his wife came to inform Wahyu, that his wife had run away with Little Beard. Wahyu felt devastated by the loss of his savings. Little did he know, a journalist came to his door, claiming that if Wahyu agreed, to have the angel's photo published in the newspaper, he would receive 8 million rupees, and the journalist would come with the money in three days, to buy the rights to the photo. Alu, who was eavesdropping outside, was startled. 8 million rupees was a significant amount. At that moment, a villager ran over to inform them. People from the district office, accompanied by the police, were going door to door, trying to force everyone to sign the eviction order. Alu took the lead in resisting. Their ancestors have lived here, and they will never give up their land. The police wanted to kill people. Suddenly, a villager named Roy pushed Wahyu forward, hoping he would solve the problem. Little did they know, when the gun was aimed at Wahyu, it jammed. Alu took the opportunity to drive away the troublemakers. Rumors spread that Wahyu could dodge bullets, which further spread in the village. That evening, a few troublemakers sought revenge against Alu and beat him up because Alu had injured someone during the day. He had to pay 3 million rupees for medical expenses, but their family was poor, and they didn't have that much money. Thus, Alu thought of the angel photo. He stormed into Wahyu's house with a weapon, trying to force him to hand over the angel photo. But before he could get it, the villagers entered the house to thank Wahyu for what he did during the day, and some even wanted to nominate him as their leader. Despite Wahyu's repeated explanations that he couldn't hear divine messages, but the villagers were convinced that Wahyu was a prophet, and they gathered outside his house to pray. Wahyu hid the photo under a pot. Alu completely lost his patience. Finally, he came up with an idea. Alu bribed Jay from the neighboring village and convinced him to claim that during their village's movie screening, the movie Home of Angels was being shown. Thus, the angel captured by Wahyu was actually a scene from the movie. Alu led everyone and stormed into Wahyu's room, confronting him, demanding that he hand over the fake angel photo. Initially, Wahyu wanted to explain that he didn't capture a movie scene, but eventually, he found it troublesome. So he admitted that the photo was indeed fake. I wanted to earn everyone's respect, so I made up a lie. Roy was extremely disappointed, as he had always respected Wahyu. When Roy returned to the village, his child fell ill. And thanks to Wahyu, he was taken to the clinic for emergency treatment. Alu's wife was swept away by the waves before, and it was Wahyu who went into the sea to rescue her. Wahyu was already respected by everyone, so why did he lie and deceive them? The villagers left Wahyu's house. Buat ngebelain diri sendiri aja lu malas. Gimana lu mau ngebelain orang lain yuk? Alu didn't expect that Wahyu to avoid conflict would admit it. He had made the coward hand over the photo, but after searching for a while, he only found a photo of Wahyu with his mother. In anger, he tore it apart, but he found the angel photo at the bottom of the pot. However, the image on it was burnt. Alu left grumbling and cursing. At this moment, a group of armed militants stormed into the fishing village, causing trouble. The village chief rallied the men to resist. Only Wahyu, holding his mother's photo, cried. In the next moment, the entire house started shaking, as if there was a major earthquake. After the intense shaking ceased, Wahyu crawled out of the house to inspect. He found himself in the Milky Way. An angel appeared before him. She even took the appearance of Wahyu's mother. The angel grabbed Wahyu's head and bestowed upon him true prophetic powers. When Wahyu woke up again, he found himself back in the village. But this time, he became the true chosen one, capable of defending the land beneath his feet. Next story, The Other Side.
In the year 1997, Bandy used to work as a ticket inspector in a theater, and it was there that he met his wife, Dewey, and they had a son named Han. However, after the theater closed down, their lives became difficult, and they could only live in an abandoned building. In fact, Dewey was from a wealthy family, but she loved her husband deeply, and she gave up her inheritance for him. One day, Dewey had abdominal pain due to her menstrual period, so Bandy took the money to buy medicine. While he was on the bus passing by the Rimaga Theater, he had happy times working there. Bandy couldn't help but take a closer look. He went around to the back door, and found it unlocked. He pushed the door open and walked in, to his surprise, inside the theater. Many trendy young people were gathering inside, and the theater manager, Mr. Domi, was still working there. He recognized Bandy, and covered him with paint to disguise him, and asked Bandy to quickly check tickets, and welcome guests. A familiar feeling surged in Bandy's heart, and he entered work mode in a daze, checking tickets for the guests entering the theater. Afterward, he asked Mr. Domi why the theater appeared abandoned from the outside. Mr. Domi asked Bandy to go outside and take another look. Unexpectedly, the theater in front of him appeared completely renovated. Mr. Domi invited Bandy to consider whether he wanted to stay at the theater. But Bandy was concerned about his wife at home. He quickly took off his suit and hurried home. Han was shocked when he saw him. Dewey, on the other hand, came up and slapped Bandy. <laughs> Bandy looked at the calendar on the wall and realized that it had been two years since he left home to buy medicine. Two years had passed. Overwhelmed with emotions, Bandy fainted. The next day, Dewey talked about the experiences of the past two years. They had inquired at the pharmacy. The store clerk said that Bandy left after buying the items they had been searching for a long time. There were rumors that Bandy had remarried, while others said he had fallen into the river and drowned. It was only at the beginning of this year that Dewey gave up searching for her husband. Bandy explained that he had only been at the theater for a few hours. At first, Dewey didn't believe her husband, but when she was washing Bandy's shirt, she saw the green paint on it. There was also a piece of money for buying medicine in the shirt, the same money they had used when they first met at the theater, and it had Bandy Loves Dewey written on it. Bandy had never been willing to spend it recklessly. Dewey started to believe her husband's words to some extent. After all, paint was not oil paint. How could it still have such a strong smell? After two years, finally, the couple reconciled. Dewey had been doing laundry for others during these two years, and had saved a good amount of money. She suggested renting a decent house to start anew. A new accident quickly occurred. On that day, Bandy went out to buy cigarettes. He encountered a man with a broken motorcycle halfway. He kindly went to help, but it turned out that the person was a car thief. The owner of the motorcycle arrived with others, and they caught the two and beat them up. Bandy explained that he was just passing by, but when he saw them hacking the car thief to death, Bandy quickly got up and ran away. Unexpectedly, he ended up running back to the theater he had been to before. Mr. Domi asked him to calm down. Without our invitation, outsiders cannot enter the theater. After Bandy's previous experience, he realized that this theater was not ordinary. He asked Mr. Domi and the man next to him, are you guys humans or ghosts? The man came over and hugged Bandy and asked if he wanted to exchange his current failed life for the longed for life. And if Dewey hadn't met a poor guy like you, maybe she could have had a better life. Mr. Domi, who was standing nearby, told Bandy, if you go out through the back door, you will encounter sadness and disasters. When you are ready to leave through the front door, imagine the life you dreamed of when you were young. Your wishes will be instantly fulfilled. Bandy initially wanted to leave through the back door, but he heard the owner of the motorcycle still waiting outside. He had a drink and slept on the couch for a night. The next day, he left through the back door again. But when Bandy returned home, he found that the place was being renovated. He learned from the workers that the mother and son who used to live here seemed to have moved to a rental house in a nearby village. After Bandy found out his wife's whereabouts, he immediately went there to find them. But unexpectedly, Dewey had already remarried and their son Han had reached junior high school age. Bandy returned to the old building alone, and to his surprise, Han came to find him. Through their conversation, Bandy had been missing for three years, causing great pain to Dewey, and Han didn't want his mother to suffer anymore. 
Bandy understood his son's implication and decided not to disturb their lives anymore. In the evening, Bandy returned to the theater and resumed his role as a ticket inspector. While time passed outside the theater, Dewey had grown white hair. On that day, she saw on the news that Bandy had become a homeless person. Dewey wanted to extend a helping hand to him. So, she went to the old building where they used to live. She placed her hand on the wall and softly called her husband's name. And Bandy inside the theater seemed to sense something. Mr. Domi immediately reminded him, you cannot reminisce about the past in the theater. But Bandy refused to cooperate. The memories of his wife and son were the most precious things to him. Mr. Domi called out a group of people. Kamu boleh pilih siapa saja yang kamu mau, Bandy. Bandy wanted to break free from these two women, but he was surrounded by the people behind Mr. Domi. On the other side, a group of eerie scenes flashed before Dewey's eyes. She arrived at a certain wooded area and saw a group of people conducting a mysterious ritual up ahead. Dewey saw her husband among the crowd. <laughs> It turned out the theater was just an illusion. Bandy had been bewitched by the demons in the ritual. Dewey reminisced about the beautiful memories with her husband and unexpectedly unleashed a strong power. She picked up a stick and stabbed the demon, successfully breaking the spell. Bandy was planning to escape through the back door. But Mr. Domi spoke up to stop him. If you leave here, you will only disrupt Dewey's current life and burden everyone. Bandy halted his steps. Then a new story, hypnotized, unfolds. Ali is a skilled technician, but due to congenital color blindness, he has been unable to find a job. His color blindness is severe. He can only see black and white. Fortunately, Ali has a supportive family. His wife is virtuous and kind, and his two children are intelligent and well-behaved. They never complain about their living conditions. One day, their neighbor Ivan came to visit. He is a well-known gambler in the area. Due to his knowledge of hypnosis, he often deceives people. Ivan saw Ali in a desperate situation, so he wanted to teach him some hypnosis. Lee. Lee. Huh? Lo hypnotize. Ivan hypnotized Ali, making him perceive daytime as nighttime. Curiously, Ali asked, how would I know if I am under hypnosis? Ivan said you need to establish a set of complex special actions. If you suspect being hypnotized, Try performing this set of actions. If you can't perform them, it means you are under hypnosis. Ali had just learned a set of dance moves from his son. He successfully returned to reality using this method. Ivan invited Ali to use hypnosis to deceive people for money, but he was immediately rejected by Ali. While the reality of the problem was right in front of him, Ali couldn't even afford his daughter's tuition. After being conflicted, he decided to use hypnosis to make money. Ali stood by the ATM and targeted an elderly lady. The police noticed him and approached for questioning. Ali lied, claiming it was payday and he was waiting for his boss to deposit his salary. The police didn't ask further and Ali approached the old lady. The old lady in front of him wasn't someone else. She was none other than Dewey from the previous story. Ali hypnotized her and took the money Dewey had just withdrawn. He was unaware that. He had fallen into the woman's trap. Ali felt restless the whole night, as it was his first time doing something deceitful. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by strange noises and saw the TV in his house, continuously displaying a spiral pattern. Ali liked collecting TVs, but these machines had long been malfunctioning. He unplugged it. The next day, he handed over the stolen money to his wife, Ningxi, asking her to pay the tuition fees. In addition, he also gave an additional 100,000 rupees as a subsidy for household expenses. This money of unknown origin caused a change in Ali's family. His well-behaved daughter Ayu became unusually irritable. The younger son not only fought with his classmates, but also snatched someone else's kite. The parents of the children confronted them. The woman saw that Ali couldn't provide compensation, so she took away the tomatoes they grow at home, which Ayu had carefully tended. In her anger, she started to fight with her younger brother. Ali quickly pulled Ayu away. Before he could resolve the issues with the two children, his wife Ningxi, from the supermarket, stole a large bag of things. When the two children saw the new toys, they didn't care if they were stolen or bought. They happily hugged the boxes and cheered. <laughs> Ali couldn't understand 
how his family had changed overnight. He threw the things his wife had stolen into the trash can. He wanted to educate his wife that she shouldn't break the law. But Ningsi was determined to make money. Ali could only seek help from Ivan. But Ivan spoke frankly. You have no right to blame your family. You also took things that didn't belong to you. Ali was very surprised. How did Ivan know about the robbery? He pushed the other person away and ran back home to pray and repent. Unexpectedly, he heard his wife shouting from outside. Ali rushed out to take a look. Ayu had tied up her mother and younger brother, insisting on cutting off the hands of the two who stole things. Ali quickly snatched the knife. Immediately after, the television suddenly turned on. Ningsi and the two children were smiling. Ali even received a call from his deceased father. The old man taught him that, no matter how difficult life may be, he shouldn't deceive others. Ali quickly hung up. He noticed Dewey's face appearing on the screen. He finally realized that he might have been hypnotized by Dewey. So he started dancing the steps his son taught him. But no matter how hard Ali tried, he couldn't escape the hypnotic state. Ali pleaded with Dewey to spare his family. He would find a way to repay the money. The image on the television screen suddenly changed. Ali saw himself hanging on the clock tower's hand. The next second, he found himself in the sky. Immediately after, Ayu woke Ali up. He thought everything that just happened was just a nightmare. He finally breathed a sigh of relief. But Ali quickly realized his wife's attitude was cold and the tomato potted plant in front of the door was gone. He didn't actually break free from the hypnosis. The television turned on again. Dewey warned him, when the bell rings six times and the hands become straight, you will shatter into pieces when you fall. But if you make up your mind, you can leave this place. Ali searched online for the location of the clock tower, preparing to go there. The key broke inside the lock. He was trapped in the room and couldn't leave. Finally, Ali forced himself to calm down. <laughs> Ali instantly appeared in front of the clock tower, but he couldn't climb to the highest point. His upper self slipped and fell down. Ali instantly entered a meditative state. He forced himself to take control of his thoughts and regain control. The next second, he returned to reality. Selamat Ali. Kamu berhasil keluar dari hipnotis saya. Dewey claimed Ali passed the test and could join the organization to carry out more important tasks. The story's development becomes even more mysterious, and the final chapter of the story begins. Valdia is a jewelry appraiser. She has a pair of exceptionally sharp eyes. She is often hired by customs to perform some jewelry appraisals. One day, a woman in black grabbed her. Saya pernah ketemu dengan seseorang yang punya mata bagus seperti kamu. Valdia felt that the woman was strange. She quickly shook off the woman and left. In the evening, she called her boyfriend Randy to meet up with her best friend. The two of them discussed getting married in two months. This matter is strange when mentioned. Actually, Randy was originally Valdia's brother-in-law, but since five years ago, her sister went for a job interview. She disappeared without a trace. Valdia searched every corner of Jakarta, but could never find her sister. During this process, she fell in love with Randy. Now five years have passed. Both of them have long given up hope. That night, Valdia went back to her old house to pack up. But behind a photo frame of the sisters, she found a USB flash drive. She opened her computer to check its contents. She discovered her sister's interview information and an email from the hiring manager. From PO Box 888, Valdia searched for the address online. She found that the PO Box 888 publishes job advertisements periodically. In the newspaper, the next morning, she went to the post office rental office to inquire about the owner of PO Box 888, but the staff didn't know the identity of the renter because postal mailboxes are usually rented under company account numbers and the rent for PO Box 888 was paid in full 40 years ago and it was rented for a hundred years. A woman came a couple of days ago asking the same question as Valdia. She also left her phone number. Valdia took note of the contact information. The next day, she went to visit the woman. Through their conversation, Valdia learned that the woman's husband, Adi, was once the smartest researcher in a research institute. He got involved in a corruption case and lost his job at that time. Fortunately, Adi received an interview notice and applied to a new company shortly after. No one expected him to disappear after that. Five years later, 
Adi managed to escape and return home, he had a hole in his head, resulting in the loss of some brain tissue, he forgot how to speak, like a fool, until last week, when Adi's condition improved, he wrote down P.O. Box 888 on a piece of paper, that's when the woman started investigating the truth. Valdia showed Adi her sister's photo for identification. Adi became emotionally excited upon seeing the photo. Valdia was convinced that Adi knew her sister. She asked her police friend to join her for questioning, but when they arrived at the woman's house, the entire villa had been emptied. Only the wheelchair marks on the ground proved Valdia was telling the truth. Randy took her home to rest, but on their way, another woman appeared in front of them. Valdia recognized her. It was the same woman in black who grabbed her at the customs, she wanted to get off the car, and confront the other person, but the woman in black disappeared in an instant, Valdia could only ask Randy for help, to check the surveillance footage at the customs, and find the identity of the woman in black, they were surprised to discover, that this mysterious woman, frequently appeared in various important occasions, however, the system couldn't find any information about her identity, since this lead was a dead end, Valdia had to start with the mailbox, she quickly found an urgent job, advertisement for P.O. Box 888 in the newspaper, which caught her attention, she carefully crafted a resume, highlighting her expertise as a jewelry appraiser, with a pair of highly perceptive eyes, and submitted it to P.O. Box 888, then, Valdia went to the mailbox rental office, and kept watch day and night, hoping to find the person picking up the mail, on one day, she saw two men wearing sunglasses come to collect the mail, so she hid inside their car. The men in sunglasses didn't notice Valdia's presence. After they got off and left, Valdia crawled out of the trunk. She was in an underground parking lot. The elevator leading upstairs had a password. At that moment, she received an interview message. Valdia opened the company address sent by P.O. Box 888. She discovered it was just above the parking lot. She waited in the parking lot all night. The next day, it was time for the interview. Valdia entered the elevator with the other applicants. She noticed the number keypad stopped at the 13th floor, because the company offered a high salary, with unusual requirements. Only applicants with a special talent were considered. Everyone exchanged information. The man in a suit was a soccer player, with strong legs and a healthy heart. The woman with short hair was a violinist. Her slender fingers could play moving music. Some of the others were chefs, or singers. Each applicant has an organ, that surpasses the average level of a normal person. While they were talking, the elevator suddenly stopped. Immediately after, a gas sprayed in, causing everyone inside to faint. When they woke up again, they found themselves in a strange party scene. The hands of the violinist had been cut off. Several diners were feasting on her fingers. The intelligent researcher had their head sawed open, revealing their brain. Valdia realized the danger, but the diner's claws were already reaching for her. Valdia turned around, and ripped off the waiter's badge, and spat on their eyeballs. She took the opportunity to break free and escape, but she found herself paralyzed and powerless. The twisted diners surrounded her and said, your eyes do resemble your sisters. Valdia was overwhelmed with grief. She angrily accused them. You are a group of twisted cannibals. Unexpectedly, the leader woman let out a sneer. Only eating one's own kind qualifies as cannibalism. We were never human to begin with. So there's no such thing as cannibalism. The woman raised her fork, preparing to gouge out Valdia's eyeball. In the next moment, the door was opened by someone. The protagonists from the previous six stories appeared. It turns out they gained superpowers. Through various extraordinary experiences, they were also recruited by an underground organization to secretly eliminate evil and save humanity. The diners were quickly eliminated by half. The remaining people engaged in a magical battle. Despite the demon's powerful abilities, Ali and Dewey have hypnotic abilities. They manipulate the enemy's thoughts and rescue Valdia in the meantime. Then they blow up the demon's head. Afterward, the group invites Valdia to join their organization. Let's kick their ass. The stories of the first season come to an end. Although the seven stories vary in quality, they are full of imagination and have a good cinematic feel. Although it claims to be a gimmick of seven independent, yet interconnected stories, but the final alliance is too funny. Many questions were left unanswered. If you enjoy my channel, please give me a subscription.